All right, so we're just going to go with the Merriam-Webster Dictionary. Um, the definition of goodness is the quality or state of being good. The, the definition is the quality or state of being good. Now, as a Christian, we know what that means. But the thing is, this definition is an open statement. We can, people can take it and um, interpret it however way they want. Um, so if you ever um, witness to a person and ask them, do you think you'll make it to heaven? They will say, yeah, I will make it to heaven. And then when you ask them, why do you think you'll make it to heaven? Well, because I'm a good person. And then so what do you mean? What do you mean by you're a good person? They would say, well, I do not cheat. I do not lie. I do not steal. I definitely do not kill. And I try to live a good life. I try to treat people uh, the way I want to be treated. And I believe that's the reason why I'm going to heaven. And so you get that a lot when you hear people talk about it. And, and so it gives you an idea what they, when you define goodness, the state of being good. So that's their definition is because they created that or their own definition of why they are going to heaven. So they're doing it based on the, their acts of goodness, not the acts of goodness of God, of what he did on the cross, but they did it based on what they did. And I'm guilty of that as well. Before I was saved, I created my own religion. I recreated my own what is, I consider good in my life, and I consider how to live my life, of course, among the governmental, you know, in the, being within the law and everything. Um, like, like, for example, um, I liked some part of Christianity. Back then, I didn't really call it Christ, Christian. It was more of Catholic, because if you're Vietnamese, you're either Catholic or you're Buddhist. And so I, I like some of the psalm scriptures. I said, oh, that's really nice. The scriptures are very nice. Um, I like the song, God is Awesome, before I was even Christian. Play that song all the time, just because it just sounds nice. Um, and I also like some Native American uh, spiritual aspect. So I liked a little bit of that. So I put it in my little pot of things that I believed in. And so I created my own belief system. And then, of course, I believe um, sanctity of marriage back then. I believe that um, uh, I definitely don't want to um, have marital um, relations at, before being married. I believed in those things. Of course, things that, because I wasn't really grounded in what I was believing, I allowed peer pressure to uh, bend my belief system in that aspect. So that's one things I feel guilty for what I did, didn't stand on my belief. But... When I became a Christian, it changed my whole entire thought process of what is good. Um, my foundation was crumbling beneath me. Um, what I was believing, I had nothing firm to stand on because what I built, I built on shifting sand. I didn't build myself on solid rocks, which was God. And so because when I found Jesus, learning about him, that foundation was really hard for me is because I, I just didn't know where to stand. I just didn't know, what do I do? I mean, all my belief system, it kind of come crashing down on me, what I believe, what I should do. So as I uh, became a Christian and start learning his word, I started to form a better foundation on solid rock and then being able to stand on that. And I'll go into that more about it later in this um, message about why we want to stand on the moral compass of God. Um, so that was the story. And here's the thing that you can tell that your life has changed and your moral goodness has changed. Uh, one day, I, I just recently got saved, and my cousins invited me to go to a bar. And I just got into this church and hearing, un, hearing under the um, words of pastor. And so I decided to, okay. I didn't see anything wrong about going to the bar, and so I don't drink or anything. I just kind of sit there because I'm the DD. Um, so I uh, normally don't really have much fun going to a bar, but I just say, okay, I'll go. And the minute I walked into this bar down in Norfolk, um, this cloud of heaviness came upon me, and everything just kind of like went slow motion. Have you ever seen the movie Blade? Uh, the vampire movie where they were dancing in a bar and then blood is just going all over the place. That's what I felt like I was in. And it's like, oh my goodness, I shouldn't be here. It's like, this is not for me. I, I, uh, this is, uh, but I endured it because I was there with my friends. I promised I went with them, but I just did not have fun. I just stayed in the back, waited for them to be, you know, having fun and everything and take them home. 
So, but it helped, it made my eyes open to the revelation that God has, um, that he had took the veil away from me that was hidden from me. And so now it's like, okay, I see the difference now when you follow God and then following what the world is see as normal. Um, so from that point on, I said, all right, let's find out what's the goodness of God. Let's find out what the moral compass are, what do I do in order to maintain that, and then I, that's what I use as my anchor, and which is your Bible. Your Bible is your anchor to everything you do. It, it may not be pleasing to people. It may not be good for you sometimes because you feel like you're against, everybody's against you. You feel like you're being persecuted, but ultimately justice will prevail and God will vindicate you as long as you continue to obey his word. So... Talking about that, now, how does God demonstrate his goodness? In order for us to say, okay, God, let me just take the fruit of goodness and put it in my life, and I'll just follow you. Well, some people need a little bit more understanding. It's like, okay, fruit of goodness, let me go ahead and do that. But you got to understand who God is. you got to understand that God is good. He is good all the time. He, you need to know that the God you are following and the God that you are um, trying to uh, work your salvation out, he's always good. He's never bad. You always hear some people go, well, God takes and God gives. No, God is good all the time. And that's one thing that we have to instill in ourselves. When bad things happen, you got to say, God is good. When good things happen, God is good. It doesn't matter what the circumstances. It's not about how you feel good. It's about what God said about his word. And I want to give you some example of, of that. So let's just, uh, if you Google goodness and God, you will see a lot of connection with him in the scripture. But if you go to like BibleGateway.com and just type in goodness, a bunch of scriptures will show up with the word goodness and God. But there were so many scriptures to go by, it will take us forever to go through them. So I just want to focus on Psalm 23. So if everybody turn to um, the chapter Psalm 23, we are going to go through it and see how God is good, how he demonstrates his goodness. And in Psalm 23, it's a psalm of David, and it's about the Lord being our shepherd to his people. And so if we look at verse 1, Psalm 23, starting at verse 1, this is how why God is good. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He's good because what? We don't lack anything. He said, don't worry about uh, shelter. Don't worry about food. If I take care of uh, the birds and the um, bees and every of the nature, then why wouldn't I take care of you who I created by my hands? I didn't spoke you into existence. I created you. So you are different right there. And so he is your shepherd. He wants to guide and lead us. So a good shepherd always takes care of their sheep. They're the one who stays up like your like parents are, staying up late at night while the child is sick, suffering through the night with the child. The, so he's like a parent that is there. He's going to shepherd you. If you get lost, he wants to go out and reach out for you and bring you back in. Um, so, And then verse 2 says, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He wants you to have peace in your life. He doesn't want you to go through turmoil without him. But what he is saying is that he, when you go down further, he, um, he, he wants to make sure that whatever you do, you, you have peace in your life for it. And then verse 3 says, he restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. Notice what he said is for his namesake. Is that he wants us in going the right path is not only because he wants you to make sure your life is going right, but he wants anybody around you who ha who's a witness of, of your salvation, of your faith, will be saved as well. And then verse 4 says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So when this one is connected to Psalm 46, you are my refuge, you are my strength in time of need. And so he's basically saying, yes, you are going to go through trials and testing in this life, but know that I am going to be there with you. And um, I like one commentary. This one man, uh, what's his name? Charles, was it? Charles Spurgeon. He commentated on, on Psalm 46 as um, 
God is good not because he causes things to seem or feel good to happen in our lives, but because in the midst of the storm, God comes closer to us than the storm could ever be. So we sometimes may feel like he's not there with us when we go through a struggle, um, but know that he is there. He's going to walk you through that storm, and you're going to come out smelling like a flower. And that, just like the, the, um, the three Hebrew children that were thrown into the fiery furnace, they didn't come out smelling like smoke. They came out perfectly. God was there with, him, with them. So in the same aspect, you may have to go, go through a storm, but know he's there guiding you. Knowing, you. knowing that he's there with you gives you that peace, that um, whatever happens, you will be vindicated by God. And whatever the devil means for harm, God will turn around for good. Whatever he stole from you, he's going to have to return sevenfold back to you in that aspect. And so let's continue. In um, verse 5, it says, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. See, he wants to bless you. He wants your cups to run over with abundance of blessings where it never dries up. And, and within that cup, when it runs over, you are, it's like, you know what? This is too much for me. I can't handle it. Um, I'll just give it out to people. Just like Peter and um, the disciples, when um, Jesus told them to cast their nets over the, the side of the boat, they caught so much that they had to call other fishermen to come and get those. So it's, he wants you to be able to share the blessing. He doesn't want you to feel like you don't have more than enough. He wants you to have that enough so that you can give it out to other people as well. So, so isn't God good in that aspect? And this is the one I want you to focus on. Verse 6, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord. There's the word, goodness. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Which means his goodness and his mercy will follow you wherever you go. It's never forgotten. It's not put on the shelf when you go through things. It's with you. And when we have to remember that, his goodness and his mercy shall follow us all the days of our life. No matter what circumstances are, no matter what kind of storm we go through, he is there. We just got to hold on to those words and say, Lord, you said your goodness and your mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell, dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And I'm going to, I stand on that word. I believe that. Devil, take your hands off of my family, take off of, your hold off of my finances. To, uh, I got my healing. My child is healed. Or anything that you're dealing with, you confess it. You hold on to the scriptures that helps you to get through um, this life. So, knowing that God is good, he's always good all the time, why, why, why do he want us to demonstrate the fruit of goodness? And that's the next part of uh, my part is, why does he want us to demonstrate the fruit of goodness? As a, so, if you go to Matthew chapter 5, starting at verse 14, this is a great scripture that tells us why he wants us to have um, the spirit of good, uh, spirit of good, fruit of goodness in our lives. So Matthew 5, verse 14. It starts with, You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So notice the verse 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. That's the reason why God wants you to develop the fruit of goodness. He wants your good works, what you're doing, will shine the light of Jesus in you, and people want to say, why are you like that? What makes you tick? Why, why when things happen, you're so positive? Why did you say, oh, that's fine, things will go works out, work out fine? Why aren't you stressed? How come you don't feel like you're anxious or, or, or stressed out about what you're doing? You just seem to have that peace in you. That's a God, that's the light of Jesus shining out of you. And so if you're trying to be witness to people, um, you don't even have to say anything. You don't even have to witness, if, especially a person you know is really, really close heart from wanting to receive from Christ, wanting to know about Jesus, 
you can just demonstrate the love of God just by your good works. Whatever you're doing, even if they are doing bad things to you or, or being, you're being treated in unjustly at your job or being treated unjustly in your neighborhood or anything like that, as long as you continue to do good works and continue to do what he says in the Bible, you will be vindicated, justice will prevail, and you will have favor with mankind, and you just keep going at it. So basically, the reason why God wants us to do uh, uh, good works and good, be, have the fruit of goodness is because he wants us to be the light. As you notice, there's a, a <laughs> what is it called again? <laughs> a not lighthouse. So there's a light. He wants you to be the light of the world. And so that's the main reason why he wants us to develop the fruit of goodness. Now, how do you develop the fruit of goodness? You can talk about that, but how do you develop it? Well, we can take, start off with the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments is basically what he tells you what, uh, how to live your life, of how to be good. Um, the Ten Commandments is that you shall have no other gods before you, you sh uh, before me. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Remember the Sabbath. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And you shall not covet. Those are pretty simple. And, of course, when Jesus came, they asked him about the law, the Ten Commandments. He said, I'm not here to do away with the law. I'm here to fulfill it. And then he gave the, the two love commandments. Um, love your God with your, your whole heart, your whole mind, your whole soul, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. And if you do those two... You basically do the Ten Commandments. And so this is a great place for us to go by. And so we go with this and say, well, if you have a situation, what do you do? Um, like, I would like to talk about Joseph. I was thinking, okay, what character in the Bible can I use that really demonstrates the fruit of goodness? And Joseph came to mind, and you know that boy he was faithful to God. You know he did everything right, even though he knew his brother hated him. Because he, he knew they were doing wrong, and what he was doing good exposed their sin. And they didn't like that, so they tried to bring him down so that they don't look so bad in front of their father. But Joseph always continued to be obedient to his father, continued to do right underneath his father. And even when him being good, he was treated unjustly. He was sold by his brother into slavery, and um, he was under Potiphar for a while, and then he was in prison of the Pharaoh. Um, even then, he still did good. He honored his master. He honored the people who were over him. He, he, didn't, he didn't talk bad about them. He even didn't expose the Pharaoh's, I mean, the, um, his Potiphar's wife for what she was doing. He just said, I didn't do it. I, I, she's, she, he's, he just had a private conversation with Potiphar. He didn't expose her sin. He just kept on doing good. I didn't do it. I, I, so that, that's probably why he was saved, because Paul, Potiphar knew he was a good man. He was an honest man. He was a man of integrity. There's no way I know he didn't do it. That's why he sent him to prison rather than killing him. And so, but no matter where Joseph went, God's goodness and mercy followed him wherever he went. He was blessed where he was. He was, uh, even though he was in prison, he was blessed by his masters. They knew what kind of man he was, so they didn't mistreat him. They um, gave him um, the, in charge of taking care of things. That's how much they trusted that man. Even though he was their slave, he was a, a prisoner, they, they knew his, his character. And so they knew his goodness, and that gave him the grace and favor with mankind. And then eventually, you know, he finally got to the second highest in command of Egypt. And so it took 13 years, but he kept doing good. He didn't give up. He said, why bother? Why, why do I even want to do this? I'm in prison. I'm, uh, I can't even get out. I'm not free. Why bother doing good? Why bother following God and doing what he said about the book, about honoring your masters, about doing things? And even with the two guys that were put in prison, um, the one with the, um, the wine cup barrier and the basket, uh, the bread maker, um, he even helped them out. 
and um, hoping that what he, when he helped them out with their dreams that they would help him, which later down they, one does help him. But, um, but he was trying to make it happen, but it didn't. He was in prison a little bit longer. But the thing is, he still did good and helped those people out. And, um, and he's always helping people. He's always doing good no matter where he's at. Um, so, but the other one you can talk about is Jacob as well. He didn't, now at this part we talked about doing good and being, having peer pressure. Jacob was peer pressured. Imagine your own mother pressuring you to do something that is wrong. She said, go and get the blessing from Isaac, your father. He said, well, I'm not the firstborn. And he said, but you do it anyway. You know, and it's so it's kind of hard. You're like, okay, do I obey my mom? I uh, honor her or do I not honor her and not do it? But he went ahead and did it. And consequences happen where he's running for his life from his older brother, Esau. And, of course, now he's living with his uncle Laban. And he's in, um, in love with, um, was it Rebecca? Rachel, Rachel. He was in love with Rachel, and um, so he, he made a deal with Laban that he would you know, have Rachel, but he got tricked. Okay, so that was injustice in his part. He could have said, you know what, I, I'm just going to take her with me. He could have said anything and just done something wrong, but no, he stayed obedient. He uh, stayed in good gracious with Laban, even though he was treated badly by his uncle. He continued to serve him and so he can have Rachel for his wife, and so he had Leah and Rachel for 14 years. And then when he's ready to leave, his uncle started to uh, try to steal from him because he was prospering. Goodness and mercy followed him. And so, but he continued to say, work it out with him. God gave him wisdom. God gave him what to do in order to prosper uh, within the, the struggle he had with his uncle. And eventually he, he left, and he had favor with his brother, and, uh, and reconciled with his brother. So he always continued to do good. He, he was remorseful for what he did, and he continued to get right with God. And that's what we need to do when we make a mistake, just get right with God, and then continue to do good. Um, another example um, that I like is Father's Knows Best. Have you ever watched Father's Knows Best? There is an episode where Bud and his uh, classmates were so excited to go back to school, to go to this history class. Can you imagine? But they loved the teacher there. They loved the fact the way he teaches. They loved the way he, he um, connects with them. But the minute they walked into class, they had a new teacher. They were so upset. And um, one student said, let's boycott him. Let's get him fired. Get our teacher back. And they didn't even give him a chance. They just said, let's do this. And everybody said, yeah, let's do this. And so they picked a day, and they said, we are not going to answer any question. Whatever he asks us, we're going to say, I don't know the answer to it. And so we're going to make it terrible for him, and he would have to leave. But on the other hand, he struggled with that. This man wasn't bad. He, he was a, a victim of circumstances coming in to the situation. And before this happened, this man stood up for Bud. Bud was accused of breaking the principal's door. A boy was playing with a yo-yo and swinging it, and it broke the principal's glass door. And that boy tossed the yo-yo in Bud's hand. And so when the principal walked out, Bud had the yo-yo. The door was broken, so obviously it had to be Bud. And so Bud was, no, I didn't do it. It was another kid. Well, who is it? Well, I don't know him. Yeah, that's usually the answer. And but um, the new teacher happens to be there when he saw it and stood up for Bud. And he said, Bud, did, uh, th that boy didn't do it. He didn't know Bud yet. He's like, that boy didn't do it. It was another boy who did it, and he tossed it in his hand. So Bud was vindicated, and he was okay. But so now Bud has this dilemma. This guy's not a bad guy, but I don't want to... Um, be the outcast of my, my peers. What do I do? He had a plan. He decided, I'm not going to be in class that day. I'm going to find a way. I'm sick. I broke my ankle. I'm going to do something. I'm not going to be in class. So I don't have to deal with this problem. He was running away from his problem. And so he thought this was a great way. He went to the principal and said, oh, I broke my ankle. I can't go to class. Can you give me an excuse to history class? And the principal knew what he was doing. And he said, you know, your teacher was here in here uh, a minute ago, and he was trying to make an excuse to get out of the class as well. And he knew what was going to happen, but I told him he had a friend in that class. He had you, bud. He had a friend in that class that he could help, 
and stand in there and have somebody be a support for him. And he's like, you know, I bet you it, some other your students in that class doesn't want to do this either. They don't want to. They don't want to boycott your teacher. They like him. They, they, but because of that pressure and everybody is doing the same thing, they don't want to be an outcast as well. But I bet you if there's just one person in there, just turn the tide, just do something different compared to what that leader has started, I bet you your class will do fine. So he walked into class with his head down, everybody looking around, looking at him like, oh, what's Bud's going to do? Because they look up to Bud. And so the teacher's trying to ask questions, talking about history questions, no one would answer. You see their faces, and some of them was like, should I answer, should I not answer? They looked around, and they, because they're, they're being peer pressured, they say, no, I don't know the answer. Finally, the teacher looked at Bud. Bud, what is this answer to this question? And Bud was struggling. He was struggling. His goodness was being tested. He was struggling, and he finally just, he answered the question. And that opened the door for other kids to say, you know what, if he's doing it, then I can do it. And so, and it turned the tide. And even the kid who started all this felt guilty for doing it. And said, this guy's not a bad guy, and we didn't even give him a chance. So, the moral of the story, stand up for what's right. You don't know what people are going through. You don't know that other people are just being peer pressure. And you hear about all this gun control. You hear about what's going on in the school and everything. Um, children are, some are being educated, some aren't. Some just like to take the, the opportunity to skip class. Um, but again, I, I like one person who posted on Facebook, her child wanted to do the same thing, walk out with the gun control. And she, the mother said, yeah, you can, but let me ask you this question first. Why are you doing it? Oh, because we need gun control. What kind of gun control? I don't know. I just know it's something about gun control, so I'm going to walk. It's like, well, then you can't walk out. If you don't know what, what's the purpose of it, then you're not doing it. She didn't say, no, he can't do it. She wanted him to understand and be educated for why they are doing it. Um, so you need to, we need to educate ourselves, and we need to make sure we always do good in the sight of man and in sight of God. Mainly, we want to please God. He's the one that we got to follow, and he's the one that will honor us among man. And so we will have that favor when we do that. Um, and one more example. Me, when I was, uh, just got saved, and my dad had a appendicitis attack, and he had to get surgery. I took him home one day, and the first thing out of his mouth, Yin, can you burn incense to Buddha for me? And I'm like, oh, God. And I'm a newborn baby, Christian. And I say, okay, Dad. He doesn't know that I'm praying to God. I say, well, it's just, an, just a statue there, so I have this incense in my hand, and I say, Father God, forgive me for doing this. And I didn't pray to Buddha, I just like, you know, I don't have no intention for this, but I'm just standing here making it look like I'm praying to Buddha. But, um, but then from that point on, I said, you know what, I need to stand firm on my own foundation of what God has put in place for me. Um, I allowed the peer pressure of my father wanting to honor his his wish, which compromised my belief in God. So when I said, I'm not going to do it again, I, I asked for forgiveness. And then we, and when this happens or any kind of prayer pressure come, I got to put God first place. And it did happen again. A few years later, my grandfather passed away. And my dad was say, and they, they do a huge funeral here and everything. And then my dad, we came over there and visited him. And he said, hey, can you burn incense for your grandfather? I said, oh, here we go again. I was like, OK. I looked at pastor, and I was like, OK. He wants me to burn incense for my grandfather at the altar. And, uh, and he, the pastor was looking at me, what are you going to do? And I said, ah. I said, dad. You know, I'm a Christian, right? He said, yeah. What does that have to do with anything? And I was like, well, if I do that, then I'm putting another idol before God. I can't do that. I said, Dad, I'm sorry, but I can't burn incense for Granddad. I'm, he's dead. I'm not trying to be mean to him. And I was like, it's like God is my God. I, I can't put another, person, another God over him. It's something that I can't do, Dad. And he's like, okay. Uh, I was like, I'm stressed over this. I was like, oh, my goodness, what is he going to do to me? 
He's going to yell at me. He's going to bawl. He's going to do something. He's like, what kind of daughter are you? You're not going to give me honor that is due to me, your father? And I'm, I'm running through all this. I say, oh, gosh, I'm going to go through this. He's going to kick me out of the house because that's usually what he does. He's like, get out of my house. You know, it's like if I do something, it's like, like when I first got saved and this we were in the nail shop and I'm working at the nail shop with my parents. And this was a Saturday and it's Mother's Day weekend. And then my mom said, let's go out to eat on Mother's Day. And I said, Mom, this, they, haven't, they haven't been told that I was a Christian. I can't go out that time. Can we go at 1 o'clock instead? She wanted to go 11, and we had service at 11. And um, she, so she said, why not 11? Why can't we go at 11? I said, oh, Lord, here we go. Let me, uh, well, because I am a Christian. I said, what? First thing out of my dad's mouth, get out of my house. He was like, I, I, he, he's he, because he's a Buddhist. And my mom started bawling. And we had customers. And the customer was like, what in the world is going on? And I'm like, oh, gosh. And then my mom going off, off on me. I say, what kind of daughter are you? You never do anything right. You never please me. You know, all this thing. I said, oh, here we go. <laughs> but you got to know my mom. She, she's like that. And you just got to learn to, okay, she doesn't mean it. She's just saying all this. And so, but it, it got better after a while. And they tried to do things to make me get back to Buddhism, but we'll just keep on trucking and just ignore, you know, just, just walk in love. And so now we got to a point now, okay, she's a Christian. We can't make her do Buddhist stuff, so we're not going to worry. And because there was one time um, they had a Buddha party down the street on the Filipino Cultural Center, and my mom invited me to go to the party. I didn't know what it was. Um, she just said, hey, the temple has a party. I want you to come over there. And so being pressured, I said, okay, I'll go. And then I read the sign in Vietnamese, and it says, Buddha's birthday. I was like, oh, no, what did I got myself into? And Pastor dropped me off because he said, I'm not going in there. <laughs> and I said, you don't have to go. I'll just go in there. And so I walk in there. They, they, they got Buddha everywhere on the stage. They got the monks on the stage praying. And my heart was beating. And, and the Holy Spirit was telling you, you know, you're in the wrong place. And that's the fruit of goodness trying to work in you, doing the right thing. And I'm sitting there stressed out. And so, oh, gosh, help me, Lord, here. And then finally to, just told my mom, mom, I got to get out. I can't be here. And she's like, why not? Why can't you be here? I said, because it, this goes against my religion. It goes against my belief system in God. I cannot be celebrating another idol. And so it's always that situation with us in that part. But speaking of that, so basically the fruit of goodness, doing the right thing all the time. So no matter what situation you may fall into, you got to make a decision and say, okay, I'm going to do the right thing. I'm going to follow God. I'm going to follow the Ten Commandments. I'm going to follow what God told me to do in the Bible, in the scriptures. Always do good. No matter what, you will be vindicated. You may not be a popular person, and the only person you're popular with is God, but that should be enough. And not just that, you have people in the family, in the church that is with you. And so put yourself among other believers and you should be fine. Um, so let me see what I said. Okay, so basically goodness also means how do we be good? Your word, your action. What you say defines who you are. What, whatever you, you make and promises it depends on what you do with it. Like if you said, um, if somebody asked you, hey, let's go to the movies, and you say, yeah, I'll meet you out there Tuesday, uh, on Tuesday at 6 o'clock, and you never show up. You don't even call. You just didn't, didn't show up at all, and you made that person wait. Well, what kind of character did you instill in that person and your, who you are? And so you want to make sure you keep your word. When you make it, so in, um, what, I didn't write down the chapter. I think it's in uh, Matthew. I think it's in Matthew where Jesus forbids oaths. He, he was talking about let your yes be yes, let your no be no. I understand you want to be tactful. I understand you don't want to hurt people's feelings, but you don't have to lie. Like pastor says, is my hair okay? Or it's all, a wife would say, do I look fat? <laughs> that would always put the husband in the situation of, what do I say? 
you know. But don't put the p people in that positions. Um, but so basically, be t uh, be honest. Let your yes be yes, and let your no be no. If you can't make it, say I'm sorry, I can't make it. You know, and they they'll be okay. Uh, for high school kids, you're gonna go through people who want to peer pressure you in in smoking or trying something, some kind of drugs. If they are your true friends, you say no, they'll be fine with it. If they're not, they're not your true friends. And so that's an example, like when I had friends in high school offered me some drugs. I was like, no, no, thank you, I'm fine. And they say, okay, cool. That's all it is. We, we stress about everything. What do they think about me if I say no? What would they do if I say no? Would they be, be my friends if I say no? No, just be true to who you are, what God said you are. And your light will shine. And they will see that. And that's the purpose is that we want to shine the light of Jesus over us so that people will want to know what makes you tick, what makes you different. I want something like that. And that's our witness. We want to be able to give an opportunity to say, well, let me tell you my story, why I'm like this. That gives you the door. That gives you the door to witness for Christ. Amen? So basically, in conclusion, the fruit of goodness is about doing what is morally right in all circumstances. Peer pressure of wanting to be like or going with the crowd is tempting, but we must remember that God is the one we must please first and foremost. When we honor him in our actions, we will obtain favor among men, and the light of Jesus shines through us. Justice will prevail, and changes in our society can only happen when we stand for what is right. So... Build your fruit of spirit, uh, goodness in you. Let the Holy Spirit guide you, and he will make things right. And don't stand for what is right. Don't be timid, because the devil sure is not timid. And so we want to be strong. We want to stand upright and hold your head upright. There's no shame in believing in Jesus. Amen? All right, Pastor, I'm going to hand it right back to you. I'm telling you guys so awesome. I'm sitting back there weeping a little bit. I got a wonderful wife. Amen. I mean, she is she has a heart of gold. Amen. Amen. And I'm just I'm just so blessed. And I know all you men out there probably think should think the same way about your spouse as well, that your spouse is awesome. And uh, just the persecution that she went through. They actually did throw her out of a house, out of the house that she was allowing her to stay in. They had two houses. And they, you know, I guess what happened was they said to her, um, get out of the house. And he made that idle threat. And she said, and I was there at her house. And, and, and I said, I got a place for you. I got, it was my parents' house. I had my own house. My parents had their house. Oh, that's the reason why. <laughs> She, she said, yeah, you know, I, I'm, marrying, I'm, I'm marrying this guy. He's not just a Christian. He's a pastor. <laughs> so, so anyway, that, that night, you know, it was like she was pushed to the nth degree, and she said, okay, I'm out. And that Monday, I had all my ushers, all my big brawny ushers. We got my, some brawny ushers in here, amen, all my, my, my support team. And we had a we had a U-Haul that Monday, taking all the stuff out of her house to put in part of my house. But she's staying at my parents' house. We didn't live together or anything like that. All right, she stayed at my parents' house where I stayed at my own house until we were married. And um, but uh, her parents came by, and this one guy that used to be one of my ushers, you know, he was he was a drinker. He came out of that drinking. He was you know he had a pot gun. He was older. And he looked like, you know, a Harley Davidson guy. You know what I'm talking about? And they, they looked at him and said, are you the one? You know, <laughs> has taken my daughter away. <laughs> and then they saw me and they said, oh, that good looking guy. Go ahead. You know? No, I'm kidding. But, <laughs> but anyway, it was, it was, I'm telling you, God will lead you into a drama life at times when you don't even want drama in your life. Amen. But you know what? Her parents love me now. They love our kids. They've been a blessing to us. And things will turn around when we stand for what's right. You know, even in the wedding, you know, her, the par uh, her family, they, they love like, they love three things. Uh, the, the Vietnamese culture, they love karaoke. They love drinking. And they love gambling. Well, 
Well, karaoke, I'm okay with because I'm a Christian. We can do karaoke. But the drinking and the gambling, we, we, don't, we don't go with that as Christians. Amen? And, uh, and for the wedding, they wanted us to have alcohol at the wedding, and we didn't want to have alcohol at the wedding. And finally, we just said to them, if you, and it, I mean, it was like a big deal for them. And we said, okay, if we have an open bar, you pay for it. And so, um, and so when they, we told them how much it was going to be for an open bar at our wedding, $2,000, they said, we'll drink beer out of the trunk. <laughs> Are you hearing what I'm saying to you today? In other words, <laughs> in other words, God will vindicate you. We didn't want to have alcohol at the wedding. We, you know, we didn't want to, have, we didn't stand for that. And, and so, but God vindicated us through the whole process and, uh, and the wedding was, you know, a great wedding. The reception was awesome. Some of you were there, right? And, uh, but God is so awesome. And when you stand for truth, I mean, you may, again, you may not be the most popular person, but, but you're in with God. And, God. and it's not always popular to stand for what's right. And a lot of people are bowing down to peer pressure, bowing down to this peer pressure. Listen, they're not going to be your judge. When you stand at judgment day, God's going to be your judge. And when you stand and you do the right thing, praise God, God's going to say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Amen. You can't have fear of men's opinions. But if we fear God, you will fear no man. When we have a reverential fear of God, we, will fear, fear what, we won't fear what people will think of us. Amen. And it really, it doesn't really matter what people think about us. It's what matters is what, what does God think about us. And God will turn the tide every time. I'm telling you, this church is going higher. I'm so proud of that woman. Man, I'm proud of that woman. Glory to God. Let's give her another hand. Glory to God. I, she did an awesome job this morning. Praise God. Whew. Amen. Prayed 15 years for her, and it was worth 15 years for that wait. Amen? Glory to God. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, we honor you this morning, and we just thank you for your mercies and for your goodness. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow us. And, Father, I thank you for these precious people here tonight, this morning. And, Father, I just thank you, Lord God, that you are revealing to them how precious they are to you. And that even though that we can make mistakes and we can falter at times, you are always there to pick us back up, to help us to move forward in you. And Father, I just thank you, Lord God, that, that we may have done some things in the past, but we thank you that we can put that under the blood. We can move forward in truth and victory. And Father, I just thank you, Lord God, that you're moving this church forward in you and in us being honest and having integrity and being people of our word. I thank you, Father God, that for those that are watching online, maybe you have not uh, received Jesus. Maybe you are there. You don't know if you died, you make it to heaven. Well, today is the day of salvation, the Bible says. So if you, you're ready to make that decision today, just say this after me in your heart. Say, dear God, I believe Jesus, you died on the cross for my sins. Jesus, I believe you were raised from the dead for my justification. Jesus, I receive you today as my Lord and my Savior. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen.